Today I want to talk to you about discerning your gifts, about understanding God's timing, and knowing His purpose and plan for your life. And today uh, I want to talk to you about principles that, that are in the Word of God that are important for you today. And I want you to open up with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want to use the life of David as a springboard. David was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. He was uh, one of the kings of Israel. He is, uh, he is the, the template. He wrote many of the Psalms. Uh, his life was so amazing that through him and through his bloodline would come the Messiah. And that there's something so significant to David's life. And I think he really offers for us a template on how to discover your gifts, how to understand God's timing, and how to know the purpose of the Lord. Now, here's the background. Saul was the king of Israel. He was the first king. Israel was asking for a king, and uh, they chose Saul. And how many people know sometimes, you know, God wanted to be their king, but how many people know sometimes God will let you have what you ask for? And if we look at Israel's history, we could see that it didn't go so well. That's why Jesus came, amen? He came to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the government is on his shoulders. But Saul lost the anointing. Saul was more concerned about what people thought than it was about what God thought. Uh, and so he had lost the anointing, but while he was still uh, king, he still had to finish his reign. And so now Samuel was the prophet, and he needs to look for the new king, and the Lord directs him to the house of Jesse, okay? Jesse is the father of David, and he has a lot of sons. When Jesse gets to the house, he says that he's here for a purpose, to see for the new king. The Lord had directed him to that house. Now David had a lot of brothers. David was the youngest. And when Samuel came to the house, Jesse didn't even think to go and get David to have him come and be part of this process. He was out tending to his father's sheep. And so Samuel goes through all of these, uh, these brothers and he can't find them. And, and this is important. Uh, eventually then he comes and, and, and he says, do you have any others? And then uh, of course, uh, Jesse says, okay, we have David. He's doing the sheep. Uh, let me get him. And maybe, you know, we're out of brothers, so th maybe it's this one. And this is how it rolls in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11 through 13. It says, so he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending sheep, Samuel said. Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him, and he had brought him in. And he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and a handsome feature. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel went to Ramah. I want you to understand now, David is anointed to be the next king of Israel, but Saul still needs to finish out his term until God takes him home because you were king for life. And so the period of time, check this out, the period of time between David's anointing till his coronation was about 14 to 15 years. How many people have ever felt the frustration where you know that God called you for something, but you had to wait for it to come? Maybe you know the frustration, what it's like to say, you know what, we know God wants us to be parents, but we're waiting for the birth of that child. Or maybe you're saying, you know what, I know that God has called me to do this, or you know, I know that there's something great that God has called me for, but I feel like I'm stuck in this position of life. I'm here to tell you that God's plans, he says, you know what, they stand firm forever. Every promise of God is yes and amen. But David needed to understand that the timing of God and the training of God were just as important as the anointing of God. Now, here's the deal. Before that verse, when Samuel thought that surely it would have been one of the other brothers, this is what the Lord said. He says, when they arrived, Samuel said to Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, listen to this, do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. And this is the first principle which we're going to park at, and I want you to listen. Is that if you want to understand God's plan and purpose for your life, and you want to be able to identify the giftings that God has placed in your life, 
the first thing that must surrender is your heart. For God does not look at your talents because how many people know there were better looking people in that house? There were more talented and seasoned people in that house. But what was it? It was the heart after the Lord that attracted the prophet. God sees the heart. If you want to be faithful and you want to be successful and you want to be in the middle and the center of God's will, it's a surrendered heart that gains the attention of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God, the movement of God, and the anointing of God. Amen? It starts with the heart. Would you pray with me, Father, in Jesus' name? I thank you, Lord, for all your people online and in person. I pray your blessings over this time that we have in the Word. Lord, that you just move me out of the way. And that, Lord, you speak to the hearts of your people as only you can. And that the fruit of this time in the Word would be mighty and plentiful all for your glory. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said amen and amen. You may be seated. So here's the question. I want you to lean in with me. Because you must understand that God did not call you to occupy a seat in this church. He called you to be a life-giving member of the body of Christ that serves on mission in your giftings to be a disciple. He said in his word, go into all the world and make disciples. And a disciple is a Christ follower who learns to do what the master does. But you may be saying to yourself, okay, what are my giftings? You may be saying to yourself, I'm old. Can God even use me? You may be saying to yourself, uh, I, I know I have a gifting, but I feel like I'm in the waiting room and I can't use it. How do you know God's gifting? How do you know God's timing? How do you know God's purpose for your life? And the first place it starts in discovering and knowing and moving in that gifting and discerning the timing and the will of God starts with a dedicated heart. I want you to write that down. Everything in your life starts with a dedicated and surrendered heart to the Lord. A de dedicated and surrendered heart to the Lord is the catalyst for growth in your giftings, your promotion for God's glory, and you're living in the fullness of God's plan for your life. And what you need to understand is if your heart is dedicated to the Lord, you need not compare yourself to anybody because comparison kills. Stop comparing yourself that somebody else is more talented, more gifted, that they have more favor, that they have more privilege. Can I tell you something contrary to what society says? If the blood of Jesus has saved you, you are the most privileged person on the face of this earth because you are blessed, you are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and if God is for you, nobody can be against you. If the blood of Jesus has cleansed you, if you're living on mission for God, if your heart is surrendered to God, you could be in the middle of the desert and God will make you successful and fruitful. Because the fruitfulness and the blessing of God is not dependent on your circumstance, on your upbringing, on your socioeconomic background. If God is for you, no one can be against you. And the first step to allowing God to use you in your giftings and to walk in the blessed life is a surrendered heart to the Lord and a life that is surrendered to his word, to his Holy Spirit, to his leading and guiding. Therefore, I don't have to look at anybody else. I just need to look at the word and I just need to look at Jesus. And if I'm led by the spirit, if I abide in the beauty of Jesus, the Bible says I will have fruit. Stop comparing yourself to somebody that you're not as talented as them that you're not as financially stable as them. As you're in this church right now, you're sizing everybody up. You didn't mean to do it, but you did. When we're talking about the giftings and the trajectory of your life, oh, I'm, not, I'm better than so-and-so. How come I'm not blessed? Or <laughs> I'll never be so-and-so. That's why I'm not blessed. How many people know you are not called to compare yourself to others? 
You are called to surrender your heart to God and live in line with the word of God. And if you live by the word, what does the Bible say? If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Now, I know, I know that you're debating this. I know that all socio, uh, you know, all, all, the, all, the, all the disciplines of, of education will tell you that it's all about this and it's all about that. I'm telling you, if you live by his word, if you honor his word, if you surrender to his word, if you are a living sacrifice, for the Lord. I'm telling you, God will lift you up. David was in the fields. He was the youngest of his brothers. His father thought that the older ones were the ones that were going to get anointed. But I'm here to tell you, if your resume is at the bottom of the pile and everybody has counted you out, when God looks at the heart, you know what the Bible also says? Promotion comes from the Lord. And if your heart's surrendered to God, people see it. Has anyone ever told you there's something different about you? Well, if they haven't, look to somebody and say, there's something different about you. <laughs> look at somebody and say, there's something really different about you. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is your strength. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is. So, so let's unpack this a little bit. Because I want you to understand, if you want to go anywhere, and I'm talking about in the marketplace or in the ministry, because there is no separation with sacred and secular. The Bible says everything we do, we do it for the glory of the Lord. Amen? So if you're in the mail room, you do it for the glory of the Lord. If you're the fry cook, you do it for the glory of the Lord. If you've been in the corporation for 25 years, all 25 years have been for the glory of the Lord. Not for the profit of the corporation, but for the profit of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he would be glorified. That as you lift Jesus up, everyone will be drawn unto him. Amen. A surrendered heart is the catalyst for God to do everything in your life. I want you to write this down. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He is looking for a surrendered heart, surrendered to his lordship, surrendered to his spirit, and surrendered to his word. You see... If you want to know God's plan for your life and you want to know what your giftings are, the first key to understanding your giftings is understanding that a surrendered heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in beautiful relationship with him is the key. In, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if you look at verse 2, if you look at verse 2, if you look at the end of it, what's it contingent upon? Let me ask you the question rather than just tell you the answer. To know the will of God is contingent upon what? Offering yourself as a living sacrifice. When you live completely surrendered to the Lord, then through the Holy Spirit, you are led by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. When you are led by the Spirit of God, you all of a sudden start to understand the will of God and the plan of God for your life when you're abiding in the beauty of Jesus and you're surrendered. And so here's the deal. A sacrifice is not a partial sacrifice. In the Old Testament, when they sacrificed the animal, they didn't say, well, we'll just cut off a leg, give that to the Lord, let the sacrifice live, and then that thing be hobbling around for the rest of its life like that. No, it was the whole animal, all of it, was sacrificed to the Lord. Now, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, we no longer sacrifice idols, but the Lord has called us to be a living sacrifice. And here's the deal. A living sacrifice does not have an opinion. A living sacrifice says, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. A living sacrifice says, Lord, you can have all of me Here's the sacrificial altar. You can have all of me, but not the wallet. You can have all of me, but you can have all of me, God, but 
not, my, not all my friends, not all my commitments, not all my, the things that make me happy, Netflix and chill. You can have all of me, but a living sacrifice says, you have all of me. You have my body, you have my talents, you have my abilities, you have the resources you've entrusted to my hands, you have all my relationships, you have all my behaviors, you have my vocation. I put myself on the altar for you, God, and I surrender my heart, and I say, Lord, over my relationships, not your will, but my, not my will, but your will. Over the finances you've entrusted to my hands, not, 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 not my will, but your will. Over my vocation, not, not my will, but your will. Over your plan for my life, many of the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Not not my will, but your will, because you need to understand the safest and most secure place for you to be is in the center of the will of God. Provision comes in the center of the will of God. Relationships come in the center of the will of God. Promotion comes in the center of the will of God. God fights your enemies when you're in the center of the will of God. When you're on your own, you're vulnerable. When you're in the center of the will of God, you're protected, you're directed, you're driven, you are moved by the Holy Spirit. So when it says a living sacrifice, it's like that song, all of me, why not take all of me? Oh, come on. You never been to a, you never been to a Maggiano's and heard Frank Sinatra sing that? Come on. It's all of you. Because he's either Lord of all or Lord of none. And that means I must be surrendered to his lordship. I must be surrendered to his word. And I must be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, everybody say this with me. Surrender is a daily thing. How many of you have surrendered on Sunday and picked it back up on Wednesday? Me too. (laughs) It's really easy to say in the heat of passion. Yes, Lord, my money, my contacts, my phone, my vocation. But then on Wednesday, when you realize what it's really going to cost you, you're like, oh, boy. Jesus understood that. That's why it's so important that you're led by the Spirit. Because what does the Bible say? When you're led by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And you know what one of the desires of the flesh is? Everybody say it with me. Selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Where we look out for ourselves. And we all do it. Because we struggle with the flesh. But those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God, and they put, the, they put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. And we live by the Spirit. When we live by the Holy Spirit, that means abiding in His Word, abiding in the beauty of Jesus, and having fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You have to do that every day, because I'm going to guarantee you, you could be effective for five days, but if you stop abiding in the beauty of Jesus and surrendering your life to the Lord every day, I'm not talking about getting saved every day, but just saying, every day, Lord, I sacrifice my life to you. Jesus said this. He said this. This this is what he said to them all. Whoever wants to be my disciple. And what has he called you to be a disciple? And what is a disciple? Who learns? A disciple is? That learns to do what the master does. So it says, whoever wants to be my disciple. Listen to this now. This isn't me. This is Jesus. So if Jesus said it, that's important. It's not subjective. It truly is his heart. They must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The only way to deny yourself is to live by the Spirit because you can't deny yourself on your own. I can't deny myself. My wife has been trying to get me to stay on a diet. And so yesterday, I started off, we both joined the Weight Watchers, right? And she's doing great. And I do great for about a quarter of the day. Then I get stressed and, and like I was doing great the whole day. Then all of a sudden I got stressed about something. And she had these cupcakes, these like fudge filled cupcakes for Rebecca apparently. Everything's for Rebecca. So she buys the cupcakes for Rebecca. They're out on the, on the, on the table. And after dinner I needed something sweet. And so, you know, she's like, oh, I've got cottage cheese and fruit. You can snack on that. Get thee behind me. (laughs) And when she wasn't looking, 
I went to pick up the cupcake and the cupcake disintegrated, it broke in two. So now I had fudge all over my fingers. Then I tried to stuff it in my face quick so she wouldn't see it. I had fudge all over my face. She said, what are you doing? <laughs> Snack it, track it. I'm like, no! Because I, my, my flesh was crying out, feed me. Your flesh wants to be entertained, it wants to be fed. And the only way you could deny the flesh, I'm not just talking about denying cupcakes. I'm talking about denying selfish ambition where it's like, but I need it, God. I've got to have it, God. What if you don't come through, God? Not trusting God. The only way to walk in the power that God has ordained you to walk in, it's not by your own might. It's not by your own power. It's by his spirit. And scripture says, that we're to deny ourselves daily, and the only way we can do that is by the Spirit, and to take up our cross daily and follow Him. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life from me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your very self? Whoever is ashamed of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory of the Father and the Holy Angels. So to be a living sacrifice, it is a daily surrender to the Lord as you're walking and being led and empowered by the Holy Spirit in submission to his Lordship and submission to his word. As a living sacrifice, his word becomes my life. His way becomes my direction, his opinion, his word. It becomes my heart. His his truth, his truth, the truth is a surrendered heart, I want you to write this down, is a catalyst for God calling you, equipping you, and using you, because God sees the heart, and I want you to write this down, a living sacrifice gets his attention. So how do you discover your giftings and understand God's timing? And discern the will of God for your life. Here's the first step. You ready? So it's, it's your heart must be surrendered to him. Here's, this, here's the next thing. You ready? Be faithful and multiply what he's entrusted to you right now. So I don't play poker. I don't condone gambling. But I'm just going to say it in the, in, in, the, in the vernacular that makes sense to me. You've got to learn how to honor and play the hand that you're dealt. I wish I was more than five, six, and three quarters. I wish I had hair. This is the hand that I was dealt, okay? You know, I'm not the guy you're going to ask to grab something off the top shelf at the grocery store. I'm the guy you're going to say, I dropped this. You're closer to the ground. Can you get it for me? <laughs> but I've got to understand, I may not have height, I may not have hair, but I got heart. And I've got to honor what God has entrusted to me right now. I'm going to just look at my vocation. There's a lot of people, like Elevation, be coming to the, to the, to the um, UBS on Tuesday. We got like half the church going. It's exciting. Uh, Dom's going. Willie's going. They're coming down from Pennsylvania. Nobody invited me. Okay, good. But there's a lot of pastors that would look at, at, at Stephen Furtick, who I, I think is great. And, and I'm, I, I celebrate the fact that they can travel and they can bring the gospel to different parts of the country and the world. That's awesome. But there's a lot of pastors that want to have what Stephen Furtick has, and they, they look at what they have, and instead of honoring what they have, they, they, they say, well, I'll never be that. Uh, and, and then they get down on what they have because they can never have that. And I will tell you, you'll never get there if you don't honor what God has given you now. There's a lot of you in your jobs that you look at people who have been promoted before you. And you look at other people who have high-ranking roles in your company, and you say, how is it that that person got that job and I don't? Well, it's very simple. Honor what you have, and promotion comes from the Lord. Amen? Everything you do, you do it for the glory of the Lord. So if your heart is surrendered, if you're living by the word of God, I'm going to tell you something. Your resume could be at the bottom, but if you are displaying the fruit of a disciple and you're honoring the Lord and you're doing everything to the glory of the Lord, your boss may not see you, but God sees you. Amen? So you have to be faithful with what you have now because if you can't be faithful with the little, God can't trust you with more. He has given each to you according to your own ability. 
And you may be angry at God right now. How come I don't have this yet? Why didn't I get this yet? I deserve a promotion. I deserve to be recognized. I deserve the attention. And God loves you enough to realize that there may be some cracks in the substratum of your personality that if you got it right now, all that I deserve, I deserve, I need it, they're not, remember comparison kills, that if God gave it to you now in your current state, because you're not looking at what he's given you as sacred, you think that sacred is the, (laughs) David understood he had an anointing, but he wasn't the king yet. So he was going to honor God where he was to play the harp for the king when he was all, all, uh, all distraught. That he was going to, when nobody stepped up to face Goliath, David stepped up to face Goliath. When his father said, even though he was anointed, even though he was going to be the next king, your brothers are off to war. Bring them some bread and cheese. And so what did David do? He didn't say this. Well, I'm the next king of Israel, Jesse. You forgot me in the wilderness, Jesse. I've got daddy issues because of you, Jesse. So you take the bread and cheese and you bring it to the boys because the king don't bring no bread and cheese. No, Jesus didn't look at his title and use it to advance his own agenda, to to, to serve himself. He became a servant. You know what David did? Even though he was the next anointed king, bread and cheese, he was the first DoorDash before DoorDash was even DoorDash. He brought the bread and cheese to, and while he was there, while he was serving, God all of a sudden catapulted him into his purpose. Nobody was standing up to the giant's taunt, but David said, wait a minute, how is it that this giant is taunting us every day and nobody's stepping up to him? So he goes and he steps up to Goliath and he slays the giant. How many people know that when you're faithful, God's favor finds you, open doors find you, opportunity finds you, not when you're starting to politic for yourself, but when you're faithful with what you have. David was bringing bread and cheese and then all of a sudden God opened up an opportunity for him to liberate a nation from the oppression of the Philistines. I'm speaking to somebody right now. Your door of opportunity is going to come, not as you politic for it, but as you're faithful with what's been given to you. So you five, six, and three quarters. So you bald. So you got to pass to this. So you got to work in the mess. Be faithful! Because favor finds the faithful. Favor finds people whose hearts are submitted to the Lord. So being faithful with what you have allows God to multiply it. Colossians 3.17, let's read it together. I, I want you to make it personal now. And whatever I do, ready? Here we go. And whatever I do, whether in word or deed, I do it all through the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the parable of the talents, I'm going to read it. And then it says this in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. You read along in your mind. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And he went on his journey, and the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After, being, uh, a long, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've given five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful to few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags of gold also came. And master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, see, and I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful to few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. He said, master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. 
So you know that I harvest where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So he gave the bag of gold from him, and gave it to the one who had ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." So here's the deal. This master goes on a journey and he entrusts his resources to the servants. And what you need to understand is that everything you have belongs to the Lord. Your spouse belongs to the Lord. Your children belong to the Lord. The money that is in the bank account belongs to the Lord. The money that comes from the paycheck belongs to the Lord. It is from the Lord, and he just uses your employer as a conduit. Everything you have comes from the Lord. The clothes that are on you today belong to the Lord. The accessories on you, like your watch and your rings and your jewelries, belong to the Lord. Your extensions belong to the Lord. Okay, we'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> Your car belongs to the Lord. Your house belongs to the Lord. That rental property that you have belongs to the Lord. Everything is the Lord. Your job, your opportunity, your educational experience belongs to the Lord. Your school belongs to everything that you have, everywhere that you go, it all belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to somebody else because the Bible says very clearly that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So uh, there may be some people's names on buildings. There may be some people's names on corporations. It may say Rockefeller Center and the Rockefellers have come and gone. Oh, but the government is on his shoulder. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the kill, the, the, the cattle, the hills, everything too. He owns the water. He owns the air. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So when you understand that the hand you've been dealt is not yours to possess, but it's yours to multiply because it ain't yours in the first place, it's the Lord's. The kids that God has given you are not yours. They're the Lord's. Stop manipulating them. Stop trying to micromanage their life. Trust them to the Lord. Your marriage is not yours. Your husband is not yours. Your wife is not yours because everything you squeeze with the death grip of control will, will all of a sudden start to manifest, start to cause you grief. But when you release it to the Lord, when you release it to the Lord, when you understand it's his, when you understand you've been placed there by the Lord, when you understand you're in this season because of the Lord, when you understand when you're studying and you're doing that paper at night and you feel like the school degree is never going to come and you're doing all those things that nobody sees, that you got to understand your educational process, your schooling, you do it for the Lord. When you're working and nobody sees what you're doing, when you're in the office and everyone is left and you're standing there to put the extra effort into what was done. You need to understand God sees it because you honor it as the Lord's. You honor it as the Lord's. Everything that's in your hands, every opportunity that God has given you, every place that God has allowed you to step is because of him. And so when you look at the hand that you've been dealt, stop being upset about what you don't have. Honor what you do have because the very little you do have was given to you according to your ability. But at the end of the day, it's the Lord's. And when God knows that you love what he gave you and you honor what he gave you and you know he's the source of what he gave you, then he knows he can trust you. In James chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, so when it comes to knowing your gifts, you need to understand that there are gifts that you are born with, that you're naturally talented in. Like I look at Natalia, and I remember when she was a kid and she was in the uh, all of the the plays and the productions that we had. And you just know when somebody has a natural talent, they just, she was always the one that was the actor, the the singer. And I I say this just with, just to say, it's been such a pleasure to see you grow up, but to see that God put a talent in you. He put giftings in you that it wasn't like you just went to like some Broadway camp at the age of four. You did have Pastor Lil and she was very dramatic. But there was something in you. And I look at my son, Dominic, in the very same way. I remember we used to have uh, a group of guys over the house on Saturday night to watch the UFC fights. 
and uh, we watched the fights, and Dominic would be so excited that the week before he knew we'd be hosting the fight, he'd be inviting 10 to 15 different people to the house. In fact, that bugger did it to me on the Super Bowl. He told me like a week before, calls me up from school, by the way, um, Jisha, Deanna, uh, you know, he's given like a guest list of like 20 people that he's invited to come to my house to watch the Super Bowl. And I was like, who's funding this Super Bowl party? He's like, well, um, I figured you would buy some chips and everybody, everybody's going to bring something. He pulled that junk on me. Everyone's going to bring something. I was like, Dominic, we can only fit like six people in our living room and you've invited 15. But I remember when he was young and we used to have the guys over the house, he would put on a red apron, he would come with a pad and he'd say, what can I get you to drink? Would you like something to eat? Would you like some steak? How would you look at cook? I was like, Dominic, we don't even have steak. It's 10 o'clock at night. I'm not cooking anything. There's, there's munchkins, Robert Gross brought kashi, and, uh, and, you know, we got some wings. That's what we're rolling with here. But there was a natural gifting, just like Natalia had it for the theater and, 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 and singing and acting. There's a natural gifting that was in him that was hospitality. And every one of you have some things that you are naturally good at. But I want you to pause there and understand that just because you have the gifting does it mean that you don't multiply that gift? You don't allow God to train you in that gift. You know, I, I, when I was going to preschool, we grew up in Middle Village over by Queen Center Mall. And um, when I was going to preschool, my mother brought me to this place on Queens Boulevard right over, um, you guys remember where the Alexanders was back in the day right off the expressway? If, you were, if you're from Queens, you know. You know, you know. Uh, millennials, it was there. Just look it up online. <laughs> so right over there was a place called Lost Battalion Hall. And, and in this preschool, it was like run by the parks department, but you had to audition to get into the preschool. So, you know, my mother, she thought I was special. Um, I was dumb as doornails. And she brought me to the interview. She's, she's probably right now. No, you were special. You were smart. You were smart, my baby. And maybe I was, but... The reality was it was competitive to get into this preschool. And Miss Brown was my teacher, and she did the interview. And she used to call me her man. She was like, there's my man. And you know the reason she told my mother why they took me into the preschool? It wasn't because of my education or whatever. is because I was musical. Like, I had a knack for music. I grew up around it. It was just something that was in me. It was a gifting. But just because you have a gifting doesn't mean that, you, can, that you, are, you omit training in it. If God has given you a gift, God will only use what you put on the table. And it is your responsibility to allow God not only to train you, but also allow that gift to be subject to his timing, that at the right time he will train you and he will release you all for his glory. Amen? So you have giftings that are already in you. And how many people, you could just say, don't, don't worry, you're not being proud, you're not being boastful. How many people can say you're gifted at something? Come on, even if it's whistling like this and making a loud noise, right? That's a gift. Because I can't do it. <sighs> Gabe, can you do it? Do it. <laughs> That's a gift. Amen, you got it, right? So there's gifts that you're born with, but there's also gifts God gives to you through the crucible of experience. For instance, when, when I became the pastor of the church, or was allowed to serve as the pastor of the church, amen, because I'm not the pastor. That ain't my identity. When I retire, I leave that, that mantle here for the next person. I'm just Dominic Cotignola, servant of the Lord, amen? So you need to understand your gifts are not your identity either. Your gifts are what God entrusts to you, and your gifts are subject to his timing, his training, and ultimately for his glory, right? When we came into the church, um, I was 28, uh, Lisi was 12, Peter was, was 31, and uh, Lil was 31, and we were all young. We were all under the age of 40, okay? We were a young group of people. We didn't know what we were doing. But our heart was in the right place, and we knew that God can do something if we would just trust him. Within a few years, we were, we were in, involved in a, in a million-dollar deal for an office building across the street. A couple of years later, 
We were involved in a $3.2 million building program, which we had to work with the attorney generals, which we had to work with lenders, which we had to work with contractors, which we had to work with uh, architects, engineers, interior decorators, all to do what, what you see right now. None of us had the experience, none of us had the, the, the training, but what we did was we had a willing heart. And there are some processes that God will expose you to that you're not ready for, but when you're led by the Spirit and you're empowered by the Spirit and you're not afraid to ask people questions and you, you know, see people's weakness is not that they enter into things that they're not qualified for, it's that they try and fake that they're qualified for it to try and impress everybody. Everybody repeat after me. It's okay to know what you don't know and ask someone who does for help. And I will tell you the number one thing that God did was he exposed us to processes that were bigger than what we could handle on our own, that were greater than our capacity, but we were not too afraid to ask people for help, to look to the people for advice. And we went through that process. And I'm going to tell you something. One, one building purchase was $1.7 million. Then all of a sudden, the renovation of the office in this facility was $3.2 million. And I wasn't qualified for it. The staff wasn't qualified for it. But we went through it. And look what the Lord has done. And now what happens is this. When other pastors call me up. And they're on the verge of their building projects. You know what they say, Dom, can you, can you talk to us? Because we've never done this before. We've never gone for a mortgage before. We've never dealt with the attorney general before. We've never dealt with contractors before. How did you do it? Is there any advice that you can give us? And so that was not a natural gifting. That's just something that God allowed us to do. We trusted him as he led us. We learned while we went on the job. And now God has given us giftings and talents and abilities where I can refer anyone to Peter, to Lisi to myself, to anyone who was with us in that process, and we, we got our gift through experience, through being exposed to something that was part of God's will. And here's the deal. When you are humbled in your heart, God will also allow you to get involved in things that you are not prepared for, that you're not ready for, but if you trust him through the process, if you trust him and you're not afraid to ask questions and you're willing to grow and be trained by that process, you start it as a novice, you'll go through and when you end, you're an expert, and as you give all glory to God, you will then be able to speak it into other people's lives, and I'm speaking to you. I hope you understand. I'm not just talking about my experience. I'm talking about your experience because you've been through things that I haven't been through. You've been through valleys that I haven't been through. You've been through things that God has exposed you to that you weren't ready to get involved in. But all of a sudden, because you had the right heart and you were trusting in the Lord and you were willing to learn, God teaches you through trials. And you cannot look at what God has given you through the test as junk. Use it for his glory. God will only use what you put on the table. And a surrendered heart. Is this making sense to anybody? So James 1, 16 to 18, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly light, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we may be the kind of first fruits he created. I want you to write this down. God will only use and multiply what you put on the table. God will only use and multiply what you put on the table. And faithfulness with what God has given you will bring blessing and promotion into a new level. So God's word to you is this. Be faithful in this season. God sees you. And if you do with the right heart and you depend on him and you're led by the spirit and you're under the submission of the word of God, God sees it and he will promote you. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, you may be in a season where nothing is making sense because I'm going to tell you something. You just don't learn from seasons that he brings you through of great opportunities. Some of you are saying, oh man, man, a, a, a building project and, and $3.2 million and 28 is the pastor. I'm going to tell you something. He not only taught me in great times of opportunity, he's also taught taught me through great times of distress. Everything is a teaching opportunity when you're in the center of the will of God. Oh, I believe somebody needs to hear that right now. Because you're looking at your life and you're saying, I wish it was rosy. I wish I was being promoted. I wish I had money. I wish I had that. I wish I had that. And you don't have money. And you don't have health. And you don't have this. And you don't have that. You don't have friends. And no one loves you. And da, 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 da. 
and you're in the middle of the valley, and you're saying, God, do you even see me? I'm telling you, he sees you. Be faithful even in the hard times, because David, the anointed king, did not just have to be faithful at the anointing and at the victory over Goliath. He had to be faithful when Saul was deranged by that demonic possession, and he took the spear while David was worshiping. Have you ever been hurt while you were worshiping? Have you ever been hurt while you were praising God? You were doing the right thing. You were doing what God called you to do. And then some lunatic pins you up against the wall with a spear. And then you spend the rest of your couple of years, of your formative years, running from him, living amongst the Philistines, and even having to fight with them at times. And you find yourself, instead of in the palace where you think you should be, living with the enemy in a foreign land where nobody knows your name. And it seems like so many years ago when Samuel anointed you, And now you're sitting there in the valley, and you're saying, God, do you even see me? Everybody say this with me. The process is part of the plan. And God sees me at every stage of the process. And if I'm in the center of his will, I could be with the Philistines, but God is with me. If I'm in the center of his will, I could be in the basement where nobody sees me, but God sees me. And when David was with the Philistines, God was forming him. Can I ask you something? Do you have enough surrender to the Lord to trust that even when life doesn't make sense and you are not living in the realization of the revelation he's given you, that if you're faithful even in the detours, somebody needs to hear that, faithful in the detours, faithful when you're on that exam table and you you said, I just wish I had health so I can do this thing. But faithful while you're on the exam table where God's giving you a detour where all of a sudden you have to put the dream on pause so that you got to take care of your body. Are you faithful even in the detours? Because here's the deal. God will never leave you or forsake you. Amen? God will never leave you or forsake you. He's with you. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, I'm going to speak it over your life. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Oh, and by the way, Romans 8.28, I'm going to speak. He, he, he did it for David, and he's going to do it for you. He did it for Joseph. And he's going to do it for you. All things work together for the good of those who love him and serve him and been called according to his purposes. Even when you're in the valley, the valleys are just as much of a teacher as the victories are. That's why I say you got to be faithful with the hand you're dealt. James 1, it says this. It says, consider it pure joy, verses 2 to 4. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How many people know trials are some of the greatest tools that God will use to teach us? I want you to look at somebody and say, God's not, wake up, God's not done with you yet. The key to discover your giftings and to see multiplication and to understand the will of God is to be faithful where you are with what you have. David was faithful while Samuel was at his father's house. He was tending the sheep. And I'm speaking to some of you that are learning in obscurity right now and you have not been elevated. He learned to worship when no one was looking so that he could write songs of worship that the world would see generation over in the book of Psalms. Do you catch that? I want you to open up. I mean, some of you don't have physical Bibles, but I want want to forget about what's just written about him in Chronicles and in Kings. Forget about the prophecies that are written that that through Jesus, I mean, not, not forget about it, but you understand what I'm saying. It wasn't just in the times of obscurity, but it was even in the, he was even in the times when Absalom would rise up against him and try and steal the kingdom, his own son. I want you to look at this, this section in my Bible. This is, this is all of the Psalms. And of these Psalms, some of these were written when David was a shepherd boy before he was anointed as king. When he was in the field, some of these were written when he was running from Saul. 
Some of these were written when he was running from Absalom. Some of these were written when he was joyous, and some of these were written when he was broken. Some of these were written when he failed and he committed adultery and murder. And these songs were written in heartache, they were written in joy, they were written in triumph, and they were written in tragedy, and and he learned to worship. I want you to understand this. He learned to use that harp. He learned to sing to the Lord. He learned to write out his emotions in the wilderness when no one saw, so that for generations and thousands of years later, those same words will be penned in this book, and they're bringing you life today. Come on, how many people have ever read the 23rd Psalm, and you've been encouraged? Come on now. How many people have ever read Psalm 51, right? Come on, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Create in me a pure heart. Do you realize that, that David learned how to be a worshiper in seclusion in private when no one saw, and then because he honored and he, he gave God that gift, God put him to a place where everyone would see. And how many people are grateful that the words and the worship that he penned didn't just die with him thousands of years later was still being blessed blessed by it because it's what happens when you honor God with your giftings. It will even go beyond your life through your generations, all for his glory, so that generations will be blessed for the glory of God. So he learned about combat with the, lion, with the bear and the lion. He learned how to lead and steward his father's resources. The truth is what you do and develop when no one sees, God will use for his glory where everybody sees if you can honor him even in solitude. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, right? When we honor God with everything that we have, the Bible says then he will, right? Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, it says this in the message, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first fruits and the best of your barns that will burst and your wine vats will brim over. How many people know honoring God with everything that we own? It's everything that we are. When you honor God with your whole life, he will bless you in ways that you could not imagine. For David, he honored God in every season and trusted his timing. His anointing at his coronation was about 14 or 15 years between his anointing and his coronation. And so I want you to remember that the process is part of the plan. That's why it's so important that we abide and are led by the Spirit of God and we fix our eyes on Jesus. Your gifts and God's plan for your life, I want you to write this down, are all subject to God's timing. It's all subject to God's timing and his training. That's why it's important in Galatians 5.16, it says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not... Gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. And it goes on later to say that the acts of the flesh are obvious, and one of the acts of the flesh. So, you know, it's funny, we could read through this sexual immorality, which is any sex outside of the bonds of marriage that God created. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry. Idolatry is anything that takes the place of God. Witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, right? We can go through those and we can say, yeah, those are all pretty nasty. Uh, but then we get to this one word or two words. It says this, selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. It's saying, God, what about me? It's putting me first. It's saying, Lord, I, I, need, I, I, I need this. I deserve this. No, I... I'm a living sacrifice, Lord. It's not what I want, it's what you want. And I will tell you this. On the surface, that sounds like you'll never get anything that you'll enjoy. You'll never be blessed. Sacrificing what you want for what God wants. But scripture says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. How many people have seen when you can sacrifice your own will for God's will, where you could lay down your life for the life that God wants for you? How many people have seen that God always does exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine? Selfish ambition, what I need, what I deserve, what I think I should have right now, always falls short for what God wants to give you. The truth is, 
using your gifts in the church is all in line with God's timing and vision and the needs of the house. David brought the food to his brothers and he, and he stepped up and he fought Goliath because there were needs. And David finally became king. And I want you to understand something. Every one of us are chasing something right now. There's single people that want to get married. There's married people that want to have kids. There's, there's married people that want to get the kids out of the house. We're chasing that dream too, amen? <laughs> then once the kids are out of the house, then you want to get your retirement all settled. We're always chasing something. And you need to understand that when you finally get to be the, you know, so I heard Bishop Jake say it best. And don't worry, I'm, I'll be done in about 45 minutes and we'll all be good and we'll go home. I'm just kidding. No. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end. I'm getting tired myself, okay? But Bishop Jake says this. I'll never forget what he said. He said, um, you know, you, I, I'll just put it in the context of my, um, my journey. You spend your whole, I spent from 13 to 28 dreaming about becoming a senior pastor. It was my dream. And then on April 4th, 2004, I was chosen by the Lord to serve as the senior pastor of this church. I finally get to live my dream. It's funny because once you get it, then you learn how to be it as you're on the job. So on November 28th, 1998, I became Rachel's husband. And for the last 25 years, I've been learning how to be Rachel's husband. Do you understand what I'm saying? When David became the king, he was anointed and coronated as the king, but he spent then the rest of his reign learning how to be the king that glorifies the Lord. And so what I'm saying to you is just because you get to the destination doesn't mean that you stop learning. You've got to continue to learn. You've got to continue to be hungry. You've got to continue to be useful. Just because you get to a position, the worst thing you could do is level off and stagnate. Mickey said it to Rocky when he fought 10 title defenses in Rocky III after they got back from the dedication of the statue and Clubber Lang called out Rocky and they're having this discussion. And Mickey says this, and you've heard me say it time and time again. Rock, you ain't been hungry since you won that title, Rock. All the guys that we gave to you, we protected you. You fought Creed, you fought him like a champion. But the worst thing that could have happened to a fighter happened to you, Rock. You got civilized. And what was the whole theme of Rocky III? Come on, I thought that was pretty... Natalia, yes? No? Channeled by inner Burgess Meredith. Come on. But the reality is, is that you can spend your whole life looking to win the belt. But when you lose the hunger to protect it, right, to, to, to learn more, I want you to know just because you have a position doesn't mean you stop learning. Just because God brings you, just because you get married doesn't mean you stop becoming a student of your spouse. Just because you have kids, and here's the deal, at every level, this is important. This is really important. Really important. When you get what God proclaims, remember God will only use what you put at the table. It's not just your living sacrifice until you get the gift. Now you have to continually, daily sacrifice even what God gave you in your promotion on the table. So you know what I got to do every morning? Lord, this is my marriage of 25 years. Lord, these are my children, 21, 17, and 12. Lord, this is the ministry that you've called me to be a part of. This is the office of the senior pastor in which you've asked me to serve. This is the office of the executive presbyter for the Metro East region that you've called me to serve. This is, this is, Lord, the vice chair of the board of the University of Valley Forge. I lay this at the altar. Lord, this is Dom, the person. This is my ego. These are my feelings. These are my hurts, my pains, my scars. These are my mountains and my valleys. I lay it all on the altar because when you're a living sacrifice daily and you have to sacrifice and, and deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him, it's not you just deny yourself so you can get 
get the blessing. Even when you have the blessing, you got to put the blessing back on the altar. You got to put your kids back on the altar. You got to put the title back on the altar. And you realize that everything you have is at the pleasure of the Lord, at the timing of the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you something. He could tell me something tomorrow. He could say, Dom, you've been faithful. You've served me. Thank you for over 20 years of ministry as a senior pastor, 25 at the church. But I'm just letting you know now that you got to get the church ready for your departure and start looking for the new senior pastor. What if God says that to me tomorrow? I got to be willing. Just so you could see the illustration. This is all I've known for 20 years. You think it's going to be easy to give this up when it's time? That's why I've got to practice now. That's why I got to do it now. Because one thing about life, well, this is good too. Yeah. Bicep curls get the girls. I got the girl. Then I let myself go. What can I tell you? One thing about life, think about this. You pray so hard for a spouse. And eventually one or two of you, or one, one, one of you at one point, unless you both died a tragic bungee jumping accident in Costa Rica on vacation. I saw this with my grandparents. My grandmother had to say goodbye to my grandfather. So you, you, you and those of you who are widowed know this. You pray so hard for a spouse, and then if you're blessed enough to live long enough, you have to release that spouse back to the Lord. You pray so hard for children, and then God gives them to you, and then you have to release them back to the Lord, and then eventually they get married, and you'll release them into the hands of their spouse. I'm going to need you when Rebecca gets married. I'm going to need you to just remove my fingers, my death grip from her hand so that I can release her to her cheap husband. You know why I buy Rebecca a lot of stuff on Valentine's Day? Because I really want to make it hard for that cheapskate to compete with me. <laughs> anyway, pray for me. Like I said, sanctification is a process. But even, I know I joke about it and don't let her know I said this because she's serving a kid's church and that's why she's not hearing this right now. There's going to come a time where I'm going to have to walk her down the aisle and give her away. That's why I got to lay her on the altar. There's going to come a time when this is going to need to be passed to the next pastor. And I have to lay it on the altar. Because I've been called to be nothing more than a living sacrifice. And I discover my giftings through sacrificing my whole self on the altar. I also discover his plan for my life by sacrificing in the altar. And here's the deal. You know, some of you are kind of like crying that this day isn't happening yet. Um, thank you. <laughs> but some of you think that when you release something for the Lord, that all of a sudden you walk away with nothing. When God asks you to release something, is because he's about to send something else that's greater than what you had. But in our own understanding, selfish ambition... This feeds my ego, it feeds my bank account, it feeds my giftings, it allows me to be who God called me to be. And if God's going to ask me to release this, it's for his glory. But I want you to know God does not see you as a lemon where he squeezes you out and then he throws you away because you're of no value to him. When God asks you to release something, it's always because he's sending something greater to you. And it's all for his glory. For he knows, listen to me now, for he knows the plans that he has for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope in the future. And I'm going to be excited. Listen, I am so excited. I know that there's still work for me to do here in the church, right? I'm talking about later on down the road. Sorry to disappoint some of you. But once again, it's all subject to the Lord. But I know that when I pass this baton, 
to the next pastor, which hopefully will be like Elijah and Elisha. Amen? Except I just don't want to be taken up in a whirlwind. I, rapture would be nice with all of you. <laughs> but the, the reality, are you kidding me? I would, I would take that over death any day. <laughs> but the reality is, is that when I, when I pass this baton, I'm going to be entering into probably the greatest season of life I've ever had. Because when you serve Jesus, it's not about losing, losing, losing to the point where right before death, you're just like decrepit and old. No, man, I want to go out in a blaze of glory. I want to go out knowing I've left everything on the playing field. I want to go out so that when I open my eyes, I hear these words. Well done, Dom. You were faithful. You weren't easy at times, but ultimately you surrendered and you were faithful. So come and receive your reward and spend eternity with me. Because scripture tells us we're going to give an account, not for our bank accounts and not what we did for corporations, but only what we did for him. And I pray when we get there that the rest of heaven gets a little bit of tired because of all the next city church people that God has to take the time to say. Well, that, no, no, that's not good. We, we can't say that. But well, he says to all of us, well done, next city. You always sacrificed yourself on the altar for me. You honored me in my word. You followed me. You didn't own or possess anything. Everything was under my purview. And because you were faithful with it, I'm going to bless you with more. So you're probably saying, like, how do I know my giftings then, Pastor? How do I know God's timing? God looks at your heart. And the way you discover your giftings is you're faithful with what he's entrusted to you right now. He's given each of you according to your own abilities. So play the hand that you've been dealt. It's God's. Honor it. If you're in the valley, honor it. If you're on the mountaintop, honor it. If there's money in your hands, honor it. If there's no money in your hands, honor it. If you got a car and that car is old, it's like 22 years old, and you barely got to church this morning, and you're on the Cross Island Parkway and there's a fume coming out the tailpipe because it's cracked. Here's what you do. If you got a busted up car and you're believing for a new car or a better car, take that car because it's God's car to the car wash. Get some armor roll and put it on the dash. Get the tire shine and put it on the tires. You may have four tires. None of them match. They're all four from different cars. They're all different rims from different cars. You may not even have a radio. You may even have an eight-track tape in there. Well, then put the Bee Gees on and start doing some Disco Inferno, okay? I know the Bee Gees didn't write that, but they wrote the soundtrack. To, you know, anyway, okay, good. Get in there and vacuum that car. Honor that car. You don't have a house yet. You're sitting in an apartment, and that apartment belongs to somebody else. Then you know what? You bless that apartment. You, car, you, you vacuum the carpets. You, you, you care for the place. You, because it's not, your, it's not yours. It's the Lord's. And if you can honor something that's, that's not quite ideal to what you think you should have, if you honor it and you serve the Lord with it and you use it for his glory. So if God has given you an apartment, clean it up and host it small group. Amen. Invite people over your house. Practice the gift of hospitality. If you got a car, drive people to church who have to take the bus. Amen. Honor what God has entrusted into your hands. If you're a student, realize it's only for a season. Honor God. Write the best paper. Be as studious as you can. Understand that you're never done learning. You're never done growing. Honor God. He sees your heart. Honor what he's put in front of you and be led by his spirit in surrender to his lordship in the word. And I guarantee you, he will take you on a journey that is greater than anything you can imagine on your own. He will enhance the giftings that you already have and he will give you new giftings that you never thought you'd have. In my wildest dreams... I never thought that when Jerry Stewart asked me to be considered to be the pastor of this church, he served as the executive presbyter for the Metro East region of our New York ministry network of the Assemblies of God. When he asked me if I would submit my resume to this church while I was serving here to be the pastor, I had no idea that several years later, I get to serve not only as the pastor of this church, 
but in the position he had as the Metro East Executive Presbyter for the New York Ministry Network of the Assemblies of God. How good is God? How good is God? I would have been just happy preaching here every week. But when you honor God and you allow him to use your experiences, he'll put you in rooms, he'll elevate you, he'll promote you, and he'll put you before people. Please understand. Because I understand, you're probably saying, well, pastor, that's nice, it's you. You don't work for a boss like I do who's Satan incarnate himself. Easy, Genesis. <laughs> you may be saying, Pastor, you don't understand. I work for a corporation. It's secular. It's not the church. I'm here to tell you, God is not bound by whether you work at a church or you're in a secular corporation. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Promotion comes from the Lord. And I'm telling you, if your heart's in the right place, if you show up to work and you do everything for the glory of God, your resume could be at the bottom. But by the Lord's will, because of the Lord's timing, your name will be at the top. David was in the fields hidden from Samuel. But because his heart was in the right place, God brought him back into the house. He was anointed as king, and his life was changed forever. Won't he do it for you if your heart's in the right place? Trust in God. Honor him with your life. Your best is yet to come. Would you stand with me all around this place?